Hi, everyone. Welcome back to E54. Uh, today, we'll be doing lecture 15. This is where we'll talk about thermal properties of materials and corrosion degradation. So in terms of thermal properties of materials, what we really want to understand is how does a material respond to heat? Um, and we're going to talk about a few different examples of important properties. These four that are mentioned are going to be the main things we cover. We'll talk about heat capacity, coefficient of thermal expansion, thermal conductivity, thermal shock resistance. And then we also want to talk at each stage about how various types of materials like metals, ceramics, and polymers rank in terms of these different properties so we can get a better sense of how they perform under these conditions. So to start with heat capacity, so in general, this is really describing the ability of a material to absorb heat. If we want to be more quantitative, what we're asking is, what is the energy required to increase the temperature of the material. So heat capacity, usually use the variable capital C, um, it has the units joules per mole K. And what we're, it's defined as is what's the differential energy input, dQ, per dT that's required, okay? So how much energy input is required to get a temperature change? One important thing to point out is that there's a few different ways to measure heat capacity. And for example, you can either keep the system under constant pressure or constant volume. And if you do this experiment under those different conditions, you'll measure a heat capacity and it won't necessarily be the same value. So generally, you'll measure a higher heat capacity under constant pressure than constant volume. I also wanna point out that you'll also see measurements of what's called specific heat capacity. It's the same principle, but instead it's talking about how many joules are needed to heat up a kilogram of material one unit Kelvin rather than a mole. Now, the only difference is you'll see is lowercase c. So we can think about how heat capacity changes as a function of temperature. So generally it increases until it reaches a limiting value. This plot in the middle here is showing the heat capacity at con measured at constant volume as a function of temperature. And it's showing how it starts at very, very low temperatures. It's relatively low, it increases. At some point it reaches some limit. It can't go above the gas constant, so th or three times the gas constant. Um, and generally we're really interested in this range down here where it changes as a function of temperature. Um, and we can define that temperature where this, where this starts to hit this asymptotic value as the Debye temperature, right? That's gonna depend on your material. So the atomic view of what's happening here is that energy is stored as atomic vibrations. And then as temperature goes up, so does the average energy of atomic vibrations, okay? So the, again, the basic idea is there will be some low temperature regime where heat capacity is a function of temperature. Above the divide temperature, it'll be some constant. The actual mechanism of how energy is stored um, is quite interesting. In thermal energy, we're really storing energy through what are called phonons. These are thermal waves. They're really vibrations within our crystal. This picture here is showing your atoms in your crystal at two different times. So the orange can be thought of as our normal lattice position. This is the perfectly square lattice. So if you look at any given set, they're on a perfect square lattice. These blue atoms that are shown are what would happen if we add a little bit of temperature to the system and then take a snapshot at a given time. And what you can notice is that those vibrations end up causing the blue atoms to oftentimes not fall directly on top of their original positions. And you can see the sort of wave-like behavior of these vibrations if you sort of draw a little reference line or fiducial marker. So this line right here is drawn just along one of the directions of that orange lattice. And you can see that the blue atoms are displaced in what looks like a sine wave. You can find similar type of symmetry if you draw a vertical line. So the atoms, this is half of a sine wave. So these are just vibrational modes that are interacting with each other. You can also have energy storage through um, changes in electron energy levels. This is dominant for ceramics and plastics. And you can also have this energy storage in this, these, pho these phonons that we just mentioned, okay? So those are the two main things, energy levels and the vibrational modes. 
So in terms of how the heat capacity looks for different materials, metals are generally the lowest. So again, that means that I only need to use a little bit of heat to raise the temperature of a metal, or if you want to think about it, it heats up quickly. Ceramics are a little bit higher, and then polymers are much higher. So it's rel it takes a lot of heat to increase the temperature of a polymer. You could think about this in terms of a practical example. So if you have a metal pan at home and a ceramic pan, you put it on your stove and you turn it on the same amount of heat, your metal pan will get hotter quicker. The temperature will go up quicker. Thermal expansion is just, we mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but let's think a little bit more about it here. It's describing how materials change size when they're heated. And the basic idea is that if you have your original material, it's this blue length of material, it's at a T initial, it has given dimensions. In this case, we're just interested in the length here, the initial length. If we heat it up, we would find that this bar of material is going to expand and become larger. So the thermal expansion coefficient is just trying to describe this type of event. And it basically says that the change in the length normalized by the initial length, so sort of making it a, a strain, is equal to some constant, this thermal expansion coefficient, multiplied by the cha change in the temperature, right? And again, as we mentioned earlier, the atomic view is that your sample is getting larger because the average bond length is increasing with temperature. And the view that you can understand this with is by looking at your potential energy surface for your atomic bonding and noticing that it's not symmetric. So if you go to higher and higher temperatures and you have more and more vibrations, what ends up happening is that your average spacing between your atoms increases. We already talked about that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but what we didn't talk about is how this property changes between different materials. So in this case, ceramics have the lowest set of values, metals are somewhere in between, and then polymers are relatively high. Again, just to get a physical intuition for what this means, that means that a small, um, or for a given change in temperature, polymers will swell a huge amount while metals and ceramics will be noticeably less, and ceramics at least. And really, polymers have a larger coefficient of thermal expansion because of their weak secondary bonds. So there's nothing really holding it um, into that dense packing that we see in the other systems. We can even see that type of trend within, within a given set of materials. So if we just stay within metals, and we look at aluminum, steel, and tungsten, we notice that aluminum has the highest um, thermal expansion co coefficient, tungsten the lowest, steel somewhere in between, we actually find that that's inversely related to the stiffness of the bonds. So aluminum has the lowest Young's modulus, tungsten the highest, and steel somewhere in between. So the materials which have really strong bonds, it's hard for them to expand as we heat them up. Thermal conductivity is qualitatively talking about the ability of a material to transfer heat. So this is saying, if I have a hot reservoir on the right and a cold reservoir on the left, how efficiently can my material bring heat from the hot to the cold side? If you want to think about this, this is kind of analogous to diffusivity. We're talking about transferring matter in that case. Now we're talking about transferring heat. The way we usually measure this is we'll uh, measure the heat flux. So how many joules per a given unit area for a given second are passing through some system like this. And that's going to be equal to negative the thermal conductivity and then the temperature gradient. How does temperature change with respect to position? And again, to draw an analogy with what we saw in diffusion, we had a negative sign in one of those diffusion equations because it was trying to make it clear and make it and, and correctly show that we have diffusion from high to low concentration. In the same sense, we have heat flux from high to low temperature. So this thermal, thermal conductivity has the units of joules per meter Kelvin second. And the general idea here is that at higher temperatures, you have more vibrations. And those vibrations are going to carry energy 
to the cooler regions. Thinking about it in terms of material sets, this is a case where polymers have the lowest values. Okay, Ceramics fall somewhere in the middle, and metals have the highest values of thermal conductivity. Really what this is connected to is which material sets have the most options for atoms vibrating. So in metals, the atoms themselves can vibrate and carry these phonons around. But also we have all these free electrons in the system and those can carry some of this energy too. In ceramics, we don't have the free electrons, but we do have the atoms and the ions that can vibrate around. Whereas in the polymers, we really have to have the whole polymer chain vibrate. So it's a little bit harder for that to happen. So if you also think about this, if, if I have a flame on one side of a piece of material and I'm gonna hold it on the other side, I don't want to hold on to the metal. The metal is going to very efficiently bring that heat to the other side. It might burn me. If I have that same experiment, though, and I'm holding on to a piece of alumina, so aluminum oxide, it's going to be very inefficient at transferring that heat. I can hold on to this chunk of material while I have a flame touching the other side of it. Thermal stress is what really develops inside of our materials as they're trying to expand and they can't do so efficiently, okay? So this can happen from uneven heating or cooling. It can also happen when we have a mismatch of thermal expansion coefficients. So if we put two materials together and they don't have the, the same um, value of output. Just as an example of, of where you can develop thermal stresses, um, you can think about, well, if I had a piece of metal, in this case, it's brass. I'm holding it stress free at room temperature. If I heat that up to some temperature and this, it would want to expand and lengthen and get bigger, right? We know that from the general idea of thermal expansion. But that's not always how we use materials. Oftentimes this, this metal rod might be part of a larger component. It might be part of your car's engine or something like that. Now, if this piece is heated up and it wants to expand, but it can't, it's going to develop stresses that have to balance out the fact that it can't expand. So the way to think about this is our material started off as this gray chunk. It had some length at room temperature. At the new temperature, it wants to expand. It can't, so it has to be stressed so that it keeps that same shape shown in the gray. Okay, so some compression is going to develop that keeps the change in length is equal to zero. We can think about this by saying that this thermal stress, which we can go and solve for, has to be balanced out, or sorry, this thermal strain, which develops from the, the fact that we're heating up, has to be balanced out by that stress which develops inside of the sample. In this case, we're just setting that thermal strain multiplied by the Young's modulus equal to the stress that develops inside of that sample. You could ask this question different ways. You could say, if you heat this brass rod up, but don't allow it to expand, what stresses develop? In this case, in the example problem 19.1, they flipped it around and said, as we heat this up, it develops stresses. At what point will it develop a stress of 172 megapascals in compression, so a negative stress? You could go through and solve this and find that it's 106 degrees Celsius. In terms of some practical examples of thermal stresses, there's, a, there's some things shown on this slide. Um, one simple way to understand how you can get this with disparate materials is if I have two sheets of metal, so one copper and one iron, they're the same size at room temperature. If I heat them up, they're separate. They're next to each other on the table, but they're not interacting. If I heat them up, they're going to expand different amounts. In this case, the copper is going to expand more than the iron. Okay, so that copper sheet is longer than the iron one at, at this temperature above room temperature. Now, if rather than having them separate from each other, I were to bond them together before I increase the temperature, what I would find is that this top wants to expand but can't get to the full length it wants. And this bottom is sort of pulled along for the ride. So this piece of bonded material would actually bend because one layer, the bottom, is in compression and the top is in tension. 
This is something that happens oftentimes if you actually look at a really old thermostat. So um, if you actually go to the engineering tower building, which is one of the older engineering buildings, you'll still see thermostats that kind of look like this. Um, the way this actually works is it has a spiral of layered metals like this, which deforms as the temperature changes. And what that does is it basically tells this thermostat when to tell your HVAC system to produce heat and heat your room or not. There can be unintentional uses of places where this happens too. A good example is those railroad failures we mentioned before. So in this case, these metals want to expand, but they can't because they're nailed in and, and in a given track geometry. So this causes them to buckle outwards. The, this, we all sort of understand how we can develop stresses, but it ends up leading to another set of thermal material properties, something called thermal shock resistance. So it, this is a more practical material property, but really what we're trying to say is, how does our material resist breaking when it's exposed to uneven heating and cooling? And you can think about this as if I have my chunk of material and it's really hot and I sort of rapidly quench it. So it, this can happen in different ways, but you can imagine if you take a, a piece and it's in a furnace, it's at a high temperature, it's glowing red hot and you dump it into a bucket of ice water. The outside is touching that cool water and it starts to cool down very fast. The inside does not. So what happens is your material on the outside, this blue layer, it's trying to contract during the cooling. But the inner part of the material, this red layer, is still at the temperature one, and it resists that contraction. So this material, what actually happens, it develops a tensile stress on the surface. It wants to be contracting more than it is. So it has a tensile stress. And what you're really trying to understand is, so what's the temperature difference that's produced by a cooling rate? And that's going to be connected to how fast you change your temperature, so the quench rate, and what your um, thermal conductivity of your material is. Right? So you imagine if I have a high thermal conductivity, this can rapidly equilibrate the temperature inside my sample. If it's slow, it's going to take a while. Yeah. And you want to see when this, is, this effect is large enough that you can actually fracture and break your sample. So in terms of the stresses that develop at the surface, you can again end up taking that right side of your thermal expansion equation and multiply it by your elastic modulus to find thermal stresses. And you really want to understand when those stresses get large enough to fracture. You can set this all equal, and the thermal shock resistance of a material is defined as the critical quench, quench rate for when your sample starts to break at the surface. And this is going to be dependent on other thermal properties. So when I mentioned that this is a relatively practical one, it ends up being that this depends on some of those more fundamental things like thermal conductivity, the fracture strength of your material, the Young's modulus, and the coefficient of thermal expansion. So really what you'd like to do if you wanted a material that had large thermal shock resistance, you'd want this term to be very large, meaning that you you know, relatively would want high thermal conductivity and low thermal expansion coefficient. Now, in terms of mechanical properties, you'd also want high strength and low uh, modulus. So just to summarize the first half of today's lecture in terms of the thermal properties, we're really talking about how all these different sets of materials respond to heat by increasing their vibrational energy and then redistributing this energy to achieve some sort of thermal equilibrium. We mentioned four different sets of thermal properties. This, these include heat capacity, which is the energy required to increase a, the uh, temperature of a unit of material by a unit T. Uh, polymers had the largest values. The coefficient of thermal expansion was how much stress-free strain we get when we heat up a material by a unit T. Polymers, again, had the largest values. Thermal conductivity was our ability of the material to transfer heat. Here, metals won the day and had the largest uh, thermal conductivities. And then finally, thermal shock resistance 
was a more practical version related to the ability of a material to be rapidly cooled and not crack. For the second half of today's lecture, we want to talk about corrosion and degradation of materials. Basically, what we're doing is we're talking about how our materials are reacting and interacting with the environment around them. So generally, material can be lost in multiple ways. This can happen through dissolution. So our material can sort of dissolve into the environment around it. This is what we call corrosion. We can lose material due to the formation of non-metallic scales. This is called oxidation. And these are, are the main things we're going to talk about for metals. In a sense, ceramics have already reacted. So we talked, for example, about aluminum, uh, sorry, alumina, aluminum oxide. This is fundamentally metal aluminum atoms, which have reacted with oxygen to form some compound. So these materials have really already reacted in a sense. They're very chemically stable and they're gonna be more resistant to corrosion. I included degradation in here because this is really what we call the alteration to the molecular structure of polymers. A good example of corrosion degradation is what would happen to this beautiful metal car. So this was the original uh, view of this, this old timey car. It was this polished metal. Um, if you went and you left this out in the yard or in the elements for many years, what you would come back and find is that beautiful metal shiny surface is replaced by this dull brown rusted surface. So the general mechanisms of what's happening, we'll start by talking about metals, is really a combination of, of oxidation and reduction, okay? Basically what's happening is, as our material is interacting with the environment around it, metal atoms are being turned into charged ions with some remaining electrons, okay? So the, those metals with zero charge are going to form ions. This uh, type of equation for the chemical structure, M is just standing for transition metal. So here that could be something like iron, aluminum, it could be whatever you want. An oxid uh, reduction reaction is when something like hydrogen ions in an acid solution, there could be some other reductions that happen. But if, for example, you have hydrogen ions, those are going to combine with those electrons that are produced in that oxidation reaction and form the more stable H2 molecule. The way you can think about this practically happening uh, as, a, as a system is if you have a piece of zinc material, so some metal material, and you put that in an acid solution, we know that the acid can destroy your material, okay? But how does it actually do it? It turns out that basically those hydrogen ions in that acid solution are unhappy and they want to form H2 molecules, but to do this, they need to have some electrons. So they'll take electrons from that zinc material. And the way that they do that is they have to take this <coughs> neutral zinc and form a zinc ion. And when that happens, this zinc ion breaks off from the surface, okay? So the solution is happy and the system is overall lowering its energy, but the actual chunk of metal that you put in there is losing pieces. So a common way of talking about the driving force for given electrochemical reactions is the concept of an electrochemical cell. This is showing two different examples here. The basic idea is that if I take and I put two chunks of material, I'm just talking about the left one first. So this is a chunk of iron and a chunk of copper. I'm putting them in solutions, which the only other thing in there is some iron ions on the left, and some copper ions on the right. So there's some membrane in here, they can't, those ions can't cross that membrane. If I connect these systems electrically, so allow them to interact with each other, what will happen is this iron will actually lose material. Just like we saw in that zinc and acid type of reaction. So that chunk of iron will create ions that come out into this solution. So the solution is enriched, but the chunk of material starts to degrade. And when that happens, those electrons are gonna come into this circuit. Those electrons will come over and interact with this copper, and that copper is actually gonna grow. So the iron is losing 
solid pieces, the copper is growing. And what it's doing is it's taking those charged ions, they're, they're combining with those electrons that come, and we're adding copper to the material. Now, this type of behavior of, of this iron falling apart isn't fundamental to iron. It's really connected to the interplay between iron and copper. So you could redo this experiment with a different metal. So the left side of this electrochemical cell is kept exactly the same. The right side, we're replacing copper with zinc in a zinc solution. Now, if you redo this experiment, instead, the current is gonna flow from right to left. The iron solid piece will grow and the zinc solid piece will shrink, okay? Now, this is one way of talking about the tendency of these materials to degrade over time. As you can imagine, you would really, to fully understand this, you really have to, if you wanna understand what iron does, you'd have to create a you know, hundred different experiments of it with relation to other metals. So more common is we wanna keep a constant reference state and understand how the relative tendency for these different reactions to happen. So the way we do this is we actually keep the right side of one of these electrochemical cells constant. We put something that's relatively inert, so something like platinum. And then on the left, we could put in different materials and see how they uh, react. Now, we can do that for different materials and look at different reactions happening at the anodes. This is showing what's, some, what's called the standard electromotive force or EMF series. And this is a collection of those different possible reactions that can happen. So at the top, these are things which produce a positive electrode potential. And these are things which you can think of as increasingly inert. They don't wanna react very well, much. You have to put, actually put energy in to make that reaction happen. On the bottom are things, they have a negative electrode potential. This actually means they're more and more active. So if we just put these systems together, that reaction is gonna take place and it's gonna actually create this potential. The way of thinking about this is that things on the bottom are very active and reactive and the top are very inert. So if you look at a few different things that you can recognize, things like aluminum and platinum and silver, these are like noble metals, these are very inert. And then things like um, sodium and potassium, uh, these are the type of things, uh, you shouldn't do this experiment, but if you throw potassium into a bucket of water, it explodes, it reacts violently, all right? So this is one way of categorizing this type of feature. Another common way of doing this is, is to create what's called the galvanic series. The basic idea is you put material in, in seawater under constant conditions and see how it degrades. And again, you can rank order how much things corrode. Um, top is where things are pretty inert and don't corrode much. Bottom is where they corrode a ton. And again, the, the, the ranking actually is very similar to what you see in the EMF series. So platinum gold up at the top, things like zinc and magnesium down here at the bottom. In fact, if you look, these are zinc and magnesium were near the bottom of this other plot. Things like sodium, potassium, they don't even have on here because it's a nonsensical experiment. You wouldn't be able to sort of measure it in the controlled manner. So in terms of, you know, corrosion is a pretty sort of uh, practical type of behavior, which depends on a lot of different uh, variables, but we do want to have some sort of practical metric for how much material we're losing. A common example of one of these is something called the corrosion penetration rate or CPR. And this is defined as what's the weight lost of your material divided by the density, the exposed area, and the time. So this is, a lot of this should look very similar. So it's basically trying to connect and, and remove the influence of geometry. So, you know, how, what's your specimen area? That should bias things. What's the density of your material? That's gonna affect the weight. And then also how long you allow this reaction to happen. So this is just trying to take how much material is lost and normalize it as much as possible. This K here is just a constant that's used to account for the fact that people do these measurements with different units. Sometimes they'll wanna know what's the, in standard units, what's the mils per year that's lost. So this 1,000th of an inch per year that's lost. Other times they'll wanna talk about the millimeters per year that's lost. So that K is just a way to convert between the units. 
And we can actually get lots of different forms of corrosion. We can have what's called uniform attack. This is what's happening at the surface here on the top. So basically everywhere on that surface is degrading and rusting. We can have what's called galvanic corrosion. So this is almost like a, a uncontrolled version of that uh, galvanic series. And for example, if you have different types of materials connected, what you'll find is the one that's lower on that galvanic series is gonna undergo all of the corrosion. So in this case, a brass screw with a steel nut at the end of it, if you go and put this in some corrosive environment, the more reactive species, the mild steel, is gonna get destroyed and the brass is totally unaffected. And if you think about, this is kind of interesting because if you took off this mild steel nut and had a brass nut on there, the brass would be attacked and would be the one that's corroded. Okay. You can also get what's called crevice corrosion. So this happens uh, very often when we join materials together. In this case, these are two sheets that are riveted together. If you have a local geometry that creates a concentration difference in the chemistry, so uh, the chemistry is not uniform in this environment that your material is reacting with, you can end up getting preferential corrosion in one given area. In this case, a depletion of oxygen means that you get tons of corrosion where those uh, two pieces, in this crevice right here, where those two sheets are connected. Other examples include uh, something called pitting. This is where you have small holes that form on the surface and these holes continue to degrade. So you don't have uniform uh, degradation of the surface. Instead, it happens at one spot and then it really intensifies and localizes there and you get nearly vertical growth of these uh, holes in the surface. Inter intergranular corrosion or corrosion at the grain boundaries is also a very important type of corrosion. And a common example of this is, this is what can happen in stainless steels if you're not careful. So in stainless steels, we add chromium because it reduces the potential for our steel to degrade and undergo corrosion. Unfortunately, if you're not careful in how you process your stainless steel, you can mess up and remove some of this benefit. A common example is if you are not careful with how you weld stainless steel together, you're effectively not controlling the heating and cooling of your material. You can end up getting these chromium carbide precipitates along the boundary. So these yellow things are these new precipitates that grew. And that by itself isn't that much of a problem. The problem is, is that the region near them is depleted of that chromium. All the chromium in that white region got sucked into these precipitates. So now this region is not protected against corrosion and it can attack there. Similar types of ideas can happen in other mechanisms. Uh, one common one is, is what's called hydrogen embrittlement. So hydrogen atoms can actually segregate and diffuse very quickly along grain boundaries and change the structure of your grain boundaries so that they become very, very brittle. This is a micrograph showing, you can kind of see the grain structure outlined by this crack as it's moving through that whole sample. In terms of preventing corrosion, we have lots of different options, um, some more practical than others. The first way you could try to prevent corrosion is just by changing your material selection. So if you choose a material, it struggles to operate under those conditions or in that environment, you could go back and say, well, I'm gonna choose a different material that will survive in that environment, okay? This is often expensive and impractical. So the major way to think about this is one of the examples of a great corrosion resistant material I mentioned was gold. Well, okay, go and make your bridge out of gold. What's the problem there? Well, it's relatively rare material, it's expensive. There's all these other practical things. In terms of corrosion, it'd be great, but there's other considerations we have. Sometimes you can actually alter the environment where your process, your material is placed and actually make it so it's corrosion is not as much of an issue. A good example of this is, you know, if you, if you have something where your material is operating inside of a compressor, maybe you lower the fluid temperature or velocity that's happening. Other times you could change the concentration of some species in your solution. So if you're, you know, cooling your computer with some solution that is reacting and corroding, you could change that coolant. Um, other times you can add inhibitors to the environment. The idea here is that you're adding something else 
that's going to react with the chemically reactive species so that it doesn't interact with your material. A more practical uh, method for corrosion prevention is something is just using coatings. So if you have a steel rod that you want to use in some corrosive environment, rather than change the steel, rather than change the environment, you can actually just go and coat this with some polymer materials, which won't corrode in that environment. So now the environment is actually touching the polymer, not the metal. You can also do what's called uh, cathodic uh, protection. And the idea here is you want to supply electrons from some other external source to protect your material. Okay? This can be done passively or actively. In terms of the, the passive manner, a good example is what's called galvanized steel. The basic idea is that you coat your steel piece in some zinc coating. If we remember back to that table I showed you with the galvanic series, zinc is very corrodible. It wants to get destroyed. So what happens is this is really a sacrificial layer. As it gets destroyed, it provides extra electrons to this region, which keeps the steel from actually corroding. So basically, this, uh, this is a controlled way of, of doing that galvanic reaction. You can also do this in an active way. So if you want to protect the steel pipe rather than coating it, you can create some anode out of some piece of scrap iron or graphite that you don't really care about. And you can actually push a current through to provide extra electrons to keep that uh, corrosion reaction from happening. Oxidation is a related process, but a little bit different. Uh, the basic idea is that if you have some chunk of metal in the presence of some gas, in this case, oxygen, some of those metal ions will want to interact with those oxygen ions and form a new material, an oxide scale, so metal plus oxygen. And it turns out that the rate at which this oxide grows and how stable it is, and by that I mean does it flake off or remain intact, is really important for this oxidation type of reaction. Just to provide two very different examples, so iron oxide is what we know as rust. This is an example of a boat anchor which has rusted. And what you can see here is this brownish surface, and this is the same thing we saw in that car, is that iron oxide that's forming. It's not necessarily a problem that it's forming an iron oxide. The real problem is all of these cracks that we see on the surface. So iron oxide grows very quickly and then flakes off and breaks off of my material. And when that happens, the iron underneath can then keep oxidizing. We can contrast that with what happens with aluminum. So on the pic these pictures on the top right here are showing, these are transmission electron microscopy images. So this right here is an oxygen rich environment. This is your piece of aluminum. If you want to think this is a sort of real time picture of the schematic I showed on the slide before. <clears throat> what they're really showing here, you can see the schematic is they're showing the formation of this amorphous oxide along the surface and how it kind of fills in that space over time. And eventually at a later time, it forms this discrete layer on the surface, which is relatively stable. The reason this is actually not necessarily a bad thing is that that new layer of aluminum oxide on the surface keeps any more oxygen from getting down to that aluminum and reacting. So you end up having a really slowly growing and stable layer. So we actually think of this as a good thing. We call it a passivation layer. It keeps that reaction from happening. Those different types of reactions we just talked about can really show up if we think about the kinetics of this oxidation reaction. So a way to think about that is to make a plot. This is on the y-axis showing weight gain per unit area. So how much material am I adding on that surface versus time? And we can have different types of trends. So this red curve shows a linearly increasing behavior. So the weight of that oxidation is just proportional to time with some constant. This happens if the oxide is porous or if it breaks off because we just keep exposing our underlying material to that oxygen and having that reaction occur. We can also have a parabolic type of equation, uh, type of uh, reaction. So this is where 
we have rapid oxidation early on, the rate of that oxidation slows down, but never stops. This, never, this doesn't asymptote uh, fully to zero. So what this is describing here is something where we have an oxide forming, and then to continue that oxidation reaction, now we need to have, for example, oxygen diffuse through that oxide layer. A good example of this is copper, so copper oxide. It very quickly forms a copper oxide on the surface, and it keeps growing that oxide because the oxygen keeps diffusing through that outer oxide layer. Finally, we can have a, a, what's called a logarithmic type of behavior. This is the green curve. So the oxide grows, but really slows down and eventually stops growing. So this asymptotes to zero slope. And this is something where we form a very stable oxide that keeps those oxygen atoms from getting in and completely shuts off this reaction. And aluminum is a good example of that. So just to summarize this cor corrosion and oxidation type of discussion, um, these are the, these oxidation and reduction reactions are really the critical events that are happening for corrosion. Um, if we think about metals, certain metals can be more active than others. There's a few different ways to organize and rank your materials. The examples we talked about are the EMF series and the galvanic series. Uh, EMF is a more controlled type of environment where we make some uh, electrochemical cell. The galvanic series is where we do a corrosion reaction in seawater at certain temperature and pressure and things like that. Um, the main point here, though, is that the interaction between your material and the environment is really the critical event for corrosion and oxidation. And then finally, that oxidation isn't by itself necessarily unacceptable. It can be okay as long as it's a stable and slow-growing oxide on your material. So with that, we'll finish up for today. I'll see you soon in a Q&A session.